pressure to be here. I did not know it was the last of the series. So that's a little bit extra pressure. Um, but, you know, at least I got it at the end. Apologize for the background, but it may not be as bright. Um, I think this is what I deal with on a daily basis at my place. Um, but uh, as I said, I just thank you so much for allowing me to be here just so I could pass along to Anthony, um, but also Anthony just sends his love. He thanks you so guys so much for his prayers. Um, he, the surgery was very long, but successful. Um, he is finally home. He got home on Sunday um, and has been resting at home um, with uh, his wife, Dana, and their little one, Kala. So um, continued prayers, I'm sure, would be extremely grateful. Um, but yeah, so that, that's a huge blessing. Um, let me introduce myself a little bit more um, for you guys to know. So my name is John Milius. Uh, I'm a licensed professional counselor in the state of New Jersey. I came on board with Hoboken Grace about a year ago. And the main focus for me is I'm associate director of care, but with my major focus being launching a counseling center with Hoboken Grace. Uh, so mental health is a huge piece for me um, in my uh, in my seeking with God, and it's definitely been a huge part of the way I've sought to utilize what God has given me as my gifts to love others. And so part of that was I went back to school, I actually changed careers, went back to school for mental health and mastered, I got my master's degree, came alongside with Hope and Grace. I've been going to Hope and Grace now for over 10 years. And um, I finally have had kind of the dream that I've had from the beginning come to fruition, and that is to launch this counseling center. Um, with that, it gives me the ability to implement uh, not only the mental health piece, but the actual spiritual um, piece, the idea of how God really is needed in our lives to, we may unearth something, but we need to replace it. And that replacement for the mo for everything, really, it needs to be God as the anchor, as I always call it. And so when I was asked to speak today, I thought it was actually a very interesting topic because this topic can really mold in both the Christian faith and the scripture, but also very much in mental health. Because the situation with forgiveness is this idea that we are asked to forgive, and it can be really difficult to forgive. And there's a lot of questions about, well, what if the person is not coming to me and apologizing, or X, Y, and Z, and I feel anger and bitterness, and the understanding that us in the aspect of being called to forgive is actually less about the individual we are forgiving. And that's when that happens, that's more with the situation um, where we're actually um, involving in um, building back that relationship, right? And so that's more in the reconciliation, but really forgiveness is not reconciliation. And forgiveness is actually a big piece as well for our own self, because when we are holding on to a lot of pain, we're doing more harm to us versus we're actually doing harm to another individual. Um, and so when I say that, um, I'll explain more and I'm going to actually bring pieces both in the mental health piece, but also in the spiritual piece to kind of combine it and understand that idea of what does it really mean to forgive and forgive others because that can be really difficult. I wanted to start out actually um, and start reading a story that came from Instagram funny enough. Uh, and on Instagram, it is uh, an Instagram post. It's called Humans of New York. Many of you maybe have heard of it. Um, if not, it's actually really uh, powerful stories that come from individuals that just kind of share their own testimony. Now, it's not Christian-based, um, but this one story really hit home for me, and I thought it was a very powerful story. Um, so what I wanted to do is I was going to share my screen just so you can kind of get an, uh, a view of the story and the pictures that go along with it. So you have a little bit of a better sense. I'm going to give more of a synopsis and I'll read some and then I'll come back to the story near the end as well. So I'm going to just share my screen very quickly. Cool. So um, this story speaks about Gene and his sister. Um, now, as Gene was growing up, and he's the gentleman in the burgundy shirt, as Gene was growing up, um, he had a disability for pretty much as long as they can remember. Now, they were understood, both Gene and his sister, that there was an understanding that he wasn't born with disability, but they actually had no idea how it came about. And they were raised by a single mother uh, who did not speak about that. Now, 
as little kids, they were happy and they really enjoyed life together. But obviously as they were getting older, and when we talk about getting older, a lot of times in those situations, uh, kids can become cruel. And for Gene, he really started noticing the differences that he had from everyone else. And it brought a lot of pain and it brought a lot of anger. Um, and how people judged him, he kind of took it in. And instead of being able to really speak about it, which for a lot of kids are very tough to do, they can't put words to feelings, uh, he would act out. And he would act out in anger against his sister, um, against other members of his family, and just in general. Now, one day after a significant fight between Gene and his sister, his mother decided to sit both of them down and tell them truly what happened to Gene. And so in this story here, it speaks about what happened in this. Now, Gene's sister is telling most of the story. We actually don't know Gene's sister's name, but we hear more about Gene and she always speaks about her, uh, her experience in this as well. Sorry about that little blank there. So she, I'm just gonna start here as we huddle together, we're holding hands and my mother is so nervous that she's starting uh, staring at the floor. Finally, she looks up at Jean and says, you need to know what happened when people can't control their anger. My mother's a storyteller. She can really paint a picture with words. So what she next played like, uh, what she said next played like a movie in my head. Both of you were very young, she said. I was a single mom. I just joined the army and I needed a babysitter while I went through basic training. I chose this nice older lady and she took very good care of you until one night her husband had a heart attack and she had to rush to the hospital. She left you behind with us. She left you behind with her daughter and her daughter's boyfriend. At this point, my mother took a deep breath. She looked like she wanted to stop with every fiber in her body, but my mother is a trained soldier. So she straightened her back and continued. This time she was looking at me. Tina, ah, there's her name. You were just a baby and you started screaming. So the boyfriend began to shake you. Then he began to beat you. He beat you so hard that he broke the bones in your body. Now my mother turned to Jean. She was crying at this point and Jean, Jean, you tried to stop it. You were only three years old, but you tried to stop it. You started beating against that man's legs, so he picked you up and threw you against the wall. You almost died, and when you woke up from your coma, things just weren't the same. My poor mother, she looked exhausted by the time she had finished, but she tried to comfort him. She said all the right things. I'm so sorry, she told him. I wish I could have changed things, but everything happens for a reason, Jean. Look how far you've come. Your life is going to be so big and so meaningful. At this point, I was traumatized. I couldn't even look at Jean. So I was staring at my shoes, but I knew exactly what he was feeling. He was squeezing my hand so hard that his fingernails were digging into my palm. The next piece talks about what happened to Jean after this story of, uh, that, of the reality of what had happened to him came to light. Jean changed when he learned the truth. He spent his whole life thinking that he'd been in some horrible accident that his disability had been a stroke of bad luck, like an earthquake or a meteor. And there was some comfort in that, but suddenly this wasn't an accident anymore. It was personal. And after the day in the living room, Gene entered into, excuse my language, the F the world phase. He started fighting with everyone in the family and he was especially mean to me. He twisted my arm, he pushed me down in public. To be honest, I didn't like him anymore. None of us did. And my mother is five foot nothing, so she couldn't control him. Every, eventually things got so bad that we were going to send him out of state to live with our biological father. But I didn't want that because no matter how bad he'd gotten, he was still Gene. So she ends up, Tina ends up taking Gene into her home and ends up um, allowing him to stay with her and introducing him to friends and helping him find work. But to understand this piece is to understand the pain that Gene must have been feeling. That he had been in this, under, this misunderstanding as a child had been wronged, physically harmed. And so that anger just seeded in him. And when he found out, it just came out in so many other ways. And the funny part of that is it wasn't that he was harming the individual who had harmed him back. Instead, he was harming the ones he loved. 
And in our way of when we look at forgiveness and when we look at the pro the reasons that we are called to forgive, there are many reasons specifically called by God, but we don't look at also what the effect of holding on and being unforgiving can do to our own self. So I wanted to uh, first talk through a little bit of what is the definition of forgiveness? The definition, the action and process of forgiving or being forgiven. That's something I want you to guys hear that for. So it's the action, right, or process of forgiving or being forgiven. Forgiveness is not an emotion. You have to understand that piece. Forgiveness is an action. And I'm a therapist that looks very much at the cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy. So that means I look at very much of how we think. That leads to how we feel, and that leads to our actions. And a lot of times, the way we see things can really distort how we feel. And so forgiveness becomes this action when we can start thinking and changing our thought process. So psychologists generally define forgiveness as a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings or resentment or vengeance towards a person or a group who has harmed you. Regardless of whether they actually deserve forgiveness, forgiveness does not mean forgetting though, nor does it mean uh, condoning or excusing offenses. And to understand once again that I said forgiveness is not an emotional piece. However, the thoughts of being wronged and feeling anger and pain, those are the emotional pieces. And that can tend to lead us to not forgive because we can sit in that bitterness and let it overtake us. And so in that piece, what God has talked about forgiveness and in many different pieces of scripture, um, God has spoken in this idea of forgiveness in Matthew 6, 14 through 15. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. So right there, you know, we don't get a d definition specifically in the Bible that you're like, oh, what's the definition of sin? But you're told, I mean, of forgiveness, but you're told what you need to do right? By Christ, by God, and how we're asked to forgive and why. In Colossians 3, 12 through 14, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with, you, with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Then we have Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So here's a bit that we have to hear and that we hear over and over again. We are to forgive like God has asked us to forgive. At that, Like God has forgiven us. God purposely had his son die on the cross for us. We didn't ask for it. We didn't go to God and go, please God, forgive us. Would you please sacrifice your son so that we can be forgiven? No, God made the conscious choice of saying, hey, no, 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 I love you. I want that relationship with you. And understanding about sin is sin is an effect on a relationship. And so we want to understand that when we sin against somebody or someone sins against us, in most part, sin is involving a relationship. It's not a mistake. And very much in the idea of when we sin, we hinder pieces in our relationship with God. And so God truly took that piece and said, I'm not asking you. There's nothing you can do to achieve my forgiveness and my grace. And I'm going to sacrifice my son on the cross for this. And so if we are asked to forgive like Christ forgave us, there's a much deeper piece in that. It's not just about us saying, okay, well, when that person says they're sorry, then I'll forgive them. That's not how we're asked. That's not what God has asked us to do. So I wanted to go a little bit further more into this as well. And I wanted to um, discuss other aspects of what forgiveness means to us. Now, in the psychological world, in the understanding of psychological world, forgiveness can improve mental and physical health. Research shows to get there um, through that, that with the forgiveness, it can help us increase. I've worked with a lot of addicts 
a lot of individuals who have had some serious um, drug addictions, heroin, alcohol, um, you name it, I've, I've pretty much seen it. And I can say that for most of these individuals, it wasn't just them doing wrong to others. A lot of their childhood, a lot of pieces that fell into play, they had been hurt. And they did not know how to forgive. They did not understand what it was to be able to give to a higher power or to God. And so they instead burdened that pain, that hurt. They held on to it. And instead of trying to find a release, they turned to drugs as their numbing because it helped them to numb that pain. And so the piece of that is we can hold on to the wrongs that have been done to us and not actually seek that ability to forgive others around us. But it's not harming, as I said before, that individual. It's harming yourself. One common um, but mistaken belief is that forgiveness means letting the person who hurt you off the hook. Yet forgiveness is not about the same as justice, nor is it uh, require reconciliation. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on. Um, but a former victim of abuse shouldn't reconcile with an abuser who remains potentially dangerous, right? So forgiveness does not necessarily mean reconciliation, as I said. It also does not mean justice. And that's something that in the psychological world, we tell individuals and tell clients about so that they understand forgiveness is a different piece. And that actually very much aligns with how Christ asks us to forgive as well. And so when Christ speaks to us about forgiving, he is asking us an understanding that, hey, I want you to understand that forgiveness does not necessarily equate to justice, but he asks us to allow him to place that justice, right? To, to act on that justice. It is not on us to do so. And sometimes, yes, it means that laws are broken and then those individuals have to be put in front of a judge and X, Y, and Z, because those are laws of the world. And they still have to suffer in some kind of consequence for what they've maybe done. But forgiveness does not equate to justice. Forgiveness is a whole different piece, once again, that really revolves about you and emotionally what you're holding on to. And so there are a couple of different things. What are the effects of holding a grudge? So in the psychological world, there's a lot of effects about holding on to bitterness and a grudge. Um, it brings anger and bitterness into every relationship and new experience. It becomes so wrapped up in the wrong that you can't enjoy the present. You can become depressed and anxious, and I see this often. You can feel like your life lacks, life lacks meaning or purpose, or that you're at odds with your spiritual beliefs. And you can lose valuable and enriching connectness, connectedness with others. I personally, I'll, I'll tell a story. I was bullied a lot as a kid, very much so. Like ripped, torn, bullied words, right? Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. They, they hurt a lot. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of things that had happened in my life as I grew up. And the fact that I even had to change schools at one point and churches because the bullying got so bad. And there was one teacher that even said to me in said, hey, is it could be something that you're doing? Basically saying the way the kids picked on me, it must be something that I might be doing that causes that. It brought a lot of pain and a lot of anger. And I held on to that for a very long time. And it had dictated a lot of my life through my 20s and even my 30s of how I sought one value I didn't seek value from God. I sought value from other people. Why? Because it was the people who determined how I felt when I was younger. And I carried so much pain through that. And I wasn't able to understand really, I would say I let go, but the truth was, did I really? And I can tell you, I didn't. And the realization came when I had this one trip at church, we do something that's called Axiom at Hoboken Grace. And I went on this silence retreat and that's what Axiom is. And you learn about having conversations with God and you go off and have time on your, and you're on your own. And I can tell you right now, it's like my worst fear. 
My worst fear is being alone by myself, having to talk to God, because that means I have to let my mind actually not try to avoid the pain that I maybe have felt. And all the truth came out. I was so angry. I was angry at God. I was angry at the world. And it was interesting in that anger because I could see how that anger, it wasn't affecting per se the individuals who wronged me when I was a kid, but affected the relationships that I had now. I didn't trust people. I looked at value upon them. And if they didn't give me value, I judged myself. If they gave me value, it wasn't enough. And big, the biggest divide I had was God. Did I really trust God? Because in my anger, the anger actually distanced my relationship with God. Now, there's a scripture that actually speaks about anger. And for us, a lot of times we may see, hey, and you know, a lot of people think you have a right to be angry. It's okay to be angry. I, I would be angry too. But God actually speaks about anger as a sin. And not just as a sin, he clumps it with a lot of sins and some of the bigger ones. So um, in Matthew 21 to 22, I believe it is, um, you have heard that it is said to people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to, to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother and sister uh, in um is answerable, answerable to the court. And, any, um, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. And so the aspect of it in the big piece is how the relation of anger is in itself a sin. And for a lot of us, when we sit there and we think to ourselves, when I've been wronged by someone and I hold on to that, I don't forgive them, how do I feel? we obviously for most feel anger and some kind of bitterness. There's pain there. And I can tell you how often I've cursed under my breath when I've been hurt and I'd be afraid to say anything, but instead I would just hold on to it. Recently I had a birthday party and I had these friends and I was really excited because it was the first time in co since COVID peace that I was actually able to celebrate with my friends. And it was a great time. And then a few of my friends at the end of the night, as everyone was going, they went off and hung out with each other. I was pissed because I was like, what about me? Right? My own selfishness. I get that because I was seeking value out of them. But in that piece, I became so angry because I became hurt because I felt that I had been wronged and I struggled in the forgiving of them. And the very next day was Sunday and I went to church and I sat there and this passage, this passage of Matthew came up and it reminded me about how anger in itself is a sin. And it was funny because right at that moment, because I didn't sleep well that night, I kind of was just ruminating on the situation, just allowing my head to sink in like, well, maybe I could do this or I should say this to them or all these different pieces. But as I sat there and this passage was read to me, God was saying, no, 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 your anger is sinning against me and it is distancing you from me. And I don't want that. And in that moment, this peace came upon me and I actually sat and asked God for forgiveness of that literally sitting and saying, hey, God, you know, sometimes when I feel wronged, it becomes this selfish part of me. And I need to also seek that restitution with God. And there can be just a lot of resentment and bitterness that falls into this. And so we have to understand how do we reach a state of forgiveness? And forgiveness, there's a lot of different pieces into it, right? But one of the biggest things we need to look at is why do we um, why should we forgive? So I'm going to give you three pieces of why we should forgive. And I'm actually going to be showing you that it's coming out of a book. I utilize a bunch of different books, obviously being a counselor. Um, this one's uh, The Freedom and Power of Forgiveness. It's by John MacArthur. So he talks about why we should forgive. Um, because God has forgiven you. And remember how I said beforehand in that passage, right? Um, and what God had asked us to do, 
you know, constantly in this idea of forgiveness, he asks us to forgive like he has forgiven us. Number two, because resentment doesn't work. And I'm going to actually read a passage from this, uh, from the book um, in regards to that. And it's on page, actually, it's in another book. It's called Healing Choices. There you go on that one. It's on page 169. And I wanted to read that to you guys so you could hear a little bit more on why they speak about resentment doesn't work for you. The second reason you need to forgive those who have hurt you is purely practical because resentment doesn't work for you. Hold on to resentment in unreasonable, unhelpful, and unhealthy. Resentment is unreasonable. The Bible says it plainly. To worry yourself to death with resentment would be foolish and sen senseless thing to do. Why is holding on to resentment foolish and senseless? The practical answer is that you are only hurting yourself with your anger. And remember how I said that. The more you hold on to that, you're really only hurting yourself. Think about it. When you are angry and resentful towards someone, you're not hurting them. You're hurting yourself. You're the one who's stewing, spewing, stressing, and fretting. You're the one who's losing sleep and being distracted from the joys of life. It's not bothering them at all. They sleep great. And so sometimes we, we will stew and we almost want them to feel bad. We want that piece of vengeance. And we question it and we think about that vengeance of how it should look. But the truth is, a lot of times they're sleeping fine. And you have to understand that, once again, reconciliation looks different. And forgiveness can come in many different forms. Because in the idea of it is sometimes it's a brother sinning or hurting against another brother. And so there's accountability there, right? And you have to wear on caution of, is this something that needs to be approached and brought? Is this sin a sin that could truly harm my brother in his life as he continues to do so? And should I be accountable to him to sit him down and have that conversation? Sometimes it may be somebody who, though there's, you would think the accountability, but they may not even be believers. They may just have harmed you without knowing who God was. Much like Gene's individual who harmed him, this boyfriend, we don't know if he was a Christian or not. And in that situation, Gene was so young, he wouldn't be able to speak to him. And even as he got older, who knows if that would be a safe space for Gene. But in this piece here, how we have to look at it is, so does that mean we hold on to it if we can never confront the person, if we can never hold that person accountable? And I would like to say that God does not ask us to do that. God wants us to be able to find peace within ourselves. So how do we forgive others? Um, I have a couple different points that I got from some of these books that I really like. And one of them is reveal your heart. That's the first step. You can rep repress, but it doesn't work. So you can may hold on and hold on. And let me tell you, as a counselor and as my own experiences, repressing pieces and pain is not going to disappear. It's going to come up. And it's going to come up sometimes in really ugly matters. As I had mentioned, I've seen a lot of individuals fall into drugs and alcohol because of their repression of pain from their past. I've seen people fall into other kinds of addiction. It's not just an alcohol. I've seen eating disorders. I've seen pornography. I've seen sex addicts. I've seen all these pieces, all these different sins that we fall into because of the pain we've held onto. And so if we repress it, it's not going to work. You cannot get over her until you admit the pain. So there is no disclosure. I mean, I'm sorry. There's no closure without disclosure that came from uh, the book. I like that. There's no closure without disclosure. Um, you must actually reveal it. And so how do we reveal it? Well, one, you can reveal it one-on-one -on -one with God. You can have that conversation open and honestly with God and say, God, this really, really hurt me. And I'm in pain. You can release it by bringing in somebody else, perhaps an accountability or, or a loved one. And you can just say, listen, I feel that I've been sinned and I've been hurt on. 
And you don't have to name the individual per se, because you don't want to gossip, but you can explain to yourself, this is, I've been harmed. I've been hurt. And eventually there could be a time where you may actually reveal that heart to the individual as well. But like I said, you have to be mindful of the safety of it. The second one is release the offender. So when should we release them? Should we release them now or later, right? And, and that's the question. A lot of times, well, we think, well, I'll release them when they ask for forgiveness, but that's not what God asks of us, right? God is constantly there. And yes, we have been taught as Christians and as um, followers of God that we want to seek restitution with God. We are taught that, but that's not necessarily how everyone else knows and understands sinning and harming. And so what we're asked to do is one of the biggest pieces is that we have to release that offender. And so you might ask, okay, well, that's great. So how often, right? You, you see in Matthew 18, 21 to 22, Peter talks about this and he asks Jesus, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother and sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? No, right? I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. So what it's basically saying here is there's going to be times where maybe this pain comes back up or you see the individual and you feel a certain kind of way and you're going to have to forgive them in that moment again. And you're going to continuously have to seek that forgiveness every time that you may be striked with that pain of that anger and that bitterness. And so then part of that is how do I know I have released it then? Well, what they like to say a lot of times in this idea is you know you've released it when you don't actually think about them. Or if you do think about them, you're not conflicted with the pain. And so we wonder, well, how can I do that, right? How can I go about forgiving someone if maybe I'm not able to actually have a face-to-face -face conversation with this person? And so in counseling, we have two different roles in this, and it's kind of interesting. I do this with clients, and sometimes they like it, sometimes they hate it, sometimes I make them. Uh, but with counseling, one of the things I do is there's two things. There's the empty chair technique. Now, this may seem really weird, but the empty chair technique is actually putting an empty chair in front of you and imagining the person who has harmed you or has hurt you. And sometimes the problem is the person's no longer in your life. The person, unfortunately, maybe have passed on. You may not want to have contact with that person. So you have an empty chair where you're imagining that person in that chair. And you're actually speaking to the person and telling them how they have hurt you. Now, for some, it may seem a little strange. I'm speaking to an empty chair. But the idea of it is it's giving you the opportunity to actually speak out how that person has harmed you. Another and very popular one that I use a lot is writing letters. You can write a letter to that individual who has harmed you. I had a, a client um, who really struggled um, with pain that they still held from their father who had passed on. And they held on to it and it just led to a lot of bad choices. And so what we did is when he was ready, because I know that sometimes this can be really hard, especially how deep the pain is. Um, he sat down and he wrote out a letter and he wrote the letter uh, directed to them and he wrote out everything that he felt. And you don't have to mail this letter. In fact, likely you probably shouldn't because you might say things in there that you may not want actually human beings to hear you from it. But um, the idea of the letter is it gives you an outlet to explain what you're feeling and how you're feeling. And it is so important to allow that release there, as I said beforehand, right? It's the point of releasing that offender. And so it's an action of release. And one of the techniques I normally will do is I'll say, hey, write out these pieces. And then what we can do is we take that letter and we'll burn it. So it gives the opportunity of almost, okay, I've written it, I've put it out there, and now I'm going to have it burned up. So it no longer exists, that I have let it go. Now, how do we forgive others? We have one, reveal your heart. Two, release the offender. And then three, replace your hurt with God's peace. Oh, we hear this a lot, right? 
okay, well, you know, God loves you and, and, you know, God wants you to feel peace. And, and sometimes it's a really hard thing to kind of swallow because we hear it all the time. Um, but it is true. And one of the biggest pieces to understand that is God's going to settle the score. And I spoke about this before, right? Um, forgiveness does not mean justice is not stopped, but that God's, uh, but it is God's role to play with that justice. And so in one of these books in page 126 on the forgiveness, um, it is the forgiveness book about the freedom um, and power of forgiveness. He speaks on this specifically, and I really loved, he talked about Stephen. Um, now, it says in here, Stephen's prayer for those who stoned him um, are another example of un, um, unilateral, unconditional forgiveness. The fact that Stephen prayed for God's mercy for his murderers show that he had already forgiven them. It is true that God's forgiveness was not to be granted apart from their repentance, but Stephen himself had already made a deliberate, conscious choice to relinquish the right to retribution. He had forgiven them in his heart. This brings up an important point. Even after we have forgiven offenders for their transgression, transgressions against us, God himself may exact justice for their sins against him. Remember, someone who has sinned against you has also sinned against God. We can forgive an offense against us but we cannot grant forgiveness for sin against God. So who can forgive sins but God alone? Luke 5, 21. To forgive someone does not convey some priestly absolution, um, clearing them of sin before God. Those whom we forgive must still give account to God. And we have to remember that, that God is the one who is going to take account. It is not our role to seek out justice. I don't know how often, if any of you guys watch, I have an issue watching a lot of certain documentaries that are like murder mystery, but I love them. But one of the, uh, some of those I cannot stand because you do not see justice being served. And it gets me so angry. Like I, making, to make a murder, making a murderer, right? That was out there. It's, it's very old. Many people know it from Netflix. I could not get through like three episodes without like basically wanting to start like swinging at everybody because I was like, there makes no sense in this. How are they, you know, the, the lawyers, the cops, everything just seems so either inept or fraudulent. And it was just so frustrating. And it's interesting in those pieces because I want to take out revenge. And I feel that. I'm thinking, oh, you know, if it was me, it was me. But the problem is I'm holding into all this pain. And it wasn't even done to me, by the way. But the problem with that situation is I have to realize it's not my role all the time. Once again, understanding that sometimes in this idea of justice, um, the world also seeks justice within the legal system. And I know sometimes we may struggle with how the legal system does this, um, but to understand too that um, it does not mean justice does not get hopefully served. If someone is to harm someone or to commit murder, justice should be served. And that's the legal systems piece, but that's not for you to then seek vengeance on them right? You see a lot of those movies. I don't know if you've seen most of them. There's one horrible movie called Peppermint uh, with, gosh, I forgot, Jennifer, I forget her name. Anyway, and she seeks vengeance. I just thought about seeks vengeance out for her family, her uh, husband's and daughter's death, right? And you hear, there's tons of movies like that. And it's always about seeking vengeance. And the truth is God is basically saying, no, 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 I will seek justice as well but it is not on you to do so. And so we're asked to replace our hurt with God's peace. So in Romans 14, 10 through 13, it says, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. In other words, God in the end is going to have you record a record of all the wrongs that you have done. 
And you have to understand that that is not just you, that will be everyone. And so it is not your part to hold on to that pain and that, um, that anger. And so I know we're running out of time, but I did want to read one last piece here. Um, this is from another book that I really enjoy. It's called How to Forgive When You Do Not Feel Like It. Um, and something in here is called the heart and heart, because I do feel like one of the biggest struggles that we can have in understanding forgiveness is that we will hold on to that pain so greatly. And so reshaping the hardened heart, because in a way we, our hearts become hardened in it. Flint is a hard sedi uh, sedimentary form of quartz with a glassy appearance, and its color can be ver very dark brown, gray, blue, or black. When struck against metal, its sparks ignite gunpowder. When hit with another hard object, its splinters or blades can be shaped into sharp arrows. Heads and knives. For centuries, flint has also used to uh, build stone walls. By the way, I know I'm reading from a pink thing. Uh, unforgiveness can make you feel hard uh, and dark like flint. And over time, you can amass enough bitterness to build an impenetrable wall around your soul. But when you surrender your hardened heart to the master stone cutter, he reshapes your heart to look like his, sensitive to the needs of others. Only by dislodging the flint from your fortified wall and giving it to the Lord will he refine your heart to be like his. Realize that rather than condemnation, he offers compassion. Rather than judgment, he extends mercy. By releasing the flint into his hands, the flint of unforgiveness, he will reshape your hardened heart and make it like his. Now, I want you to guys to just remember, forgiveness versus reconciliation is different. And so reconciliation is called upon when two parties are seeking to reconcile the relationship. Forgiveness does not require the other person to seek forgiveness. It is about you wanting to see forgive the person for harming you. And sometimes when there's a reversal and you've harmed someone and you can't have that conversation with that person, you still have to seek forgiveness. And that's forgiveness is between you and God. And maybe you're going to have that opportunity to reconcile, but maybe you won't. But it doesn't mean you don't seek forgiveness for yourself, but also understanding that you should forgive those who have harmed you. So as I finish up here, I want to go one last time to this story. And so we've heard from Jean and we know that um, we've heard from Tina and Jean and how the pain of their time has come. Um, Jean finding out all these pieces has led to a lot of anger and frustration. Now Jean um, ended up moving in with Tina and they bring up something interesting in this. So one afternoon the Mormons came knocking on our door and Jean just left, let them right in. He couldn't get enough of them. And they loved him too, because Gene really is the perfect audience. He'll agree with absolutely everything you say. They started coming back week after week, and they were so loving to him. They'd take him out to eat, they'd buy him coffee, and they weren't asking for money or anything. So my mom just let it happen. Gene eventually decided to join a Methodist church. But we still credit the Mormons for introducing him to God. The entire journey has been so healthy for him. It's redirected him in such a great way. And Gene has finally found his place. Last year, he graduated from high school. He works at the community food bank. Things are coming together for him. In Gene's faith, everything is part of a plan. The big guy has got his back no matter what. And it's given him so much confidence. Sometimes he still has his moments when he goes to dark place, when he goes to a dark place when he starts feeling scared that he'll never get married or have a family, but he always comes back to God who loves him unconditionally and forgives him no matter what. For some reason, Gene is huge on forgiveness and all his prayers are for forgiveness. I've never understood it, but he asks again and again, please God, forgive me. He can be so hard on himself for not understanding and not being perfect. But I wanna read something that Gene then writes. When I was a little boy, I protected my sister from that guy. So I think it's a happy story and a sad story. The sadness that has happened to me and the happy side for me. For a long time, I thought that God wouldn't love somebody like me. But I was also a caring person. And I made an impact on the world. 
with the Special Olympics and everything like that, showing people I was just like them. At my job, people call me Superman. I lift my bo uh, I lift, uh, sorry, I lift heavy boxes with my arm and drive the forklift and helping everybody. They say, Gene, you're a hero because of the things I can do. One day I'm going to get a new body in heaven and I'll be able to do all the things that other people can do. I hope the man who did this to me is there. In heaven, I believe he'll be there because God says he should forgive, uh, we should forgive people no matter what. And everyone deserves a second chance. So I hope he's in heaven. And when I see him there, I'd like to ask him some things. Like, why did he do it to me? Maybe he didn't know what he was doing. Maybe he was angry at the world and he was angry at God. I know what that's like because I was angry at God once. Maybe the man was really sorry about what he did. And maybe he lived with the pain for the rest of his life. So when I see him in heaven, I'm going to tell him face to face that I forgive him and I love him. And then I talk to God, but not like he's God. I want to talk to him like he's my friend. I'm going to ask him for forgiveness. And I'm going to say, do you love me no matter what? I hope he tells me yes, that he understands why I made the mistakes that I made and that he forgives me no matter what. Then I'm going to ask him about the day I got hurt. Like, why did it happen? Because I was just a baby. And I'm not sure why he would let somebody hurt a baby like that. And I think maybe he will start crying. He'll tell me he saw me getting hurt that day and he let it happen, but that it made him so sad. And he had tears running down his cheeks. Seeing his son get hurt like that. And then he'll probably tell me he's sorry. And I'll tell him face to face that I still love him and that I forgive him no matter what. Now, I'm going to say that I don't think God does wrong. But in this pace, um, and in Gene's mind, right, it's understanding. And I think that's a powerful picture of realizing that sometimes when we're hurt, we don't understand. But we can come to realize that God is always there with us. And he feels that pain along with us. And so we don't have to go about it alone. And we don't. And we don't have to go about forgiving alone, but we're called to do it. And so I would just encourage everyone to just remind yourselves that the aspect of unforgiveness is just really harming yourself. And it is so important to your relationship with God that you seek constant peace and reconciliation in this with him and understanding that reconciliation sometimes means coming to him about that anger and giving to him that pain and letting him carry it so you don't have to. So thank you guys so much. I know I ran a little bit over time, so I appreciate you guys st sticking with me. Not a problem at all. That was, it was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much for joining us your first time here. Yes. And it was a fantastic way to, uh, to end this, this series. Um, so thank you so much. We, I mean, I certainly really enjoyed that. So awesome. Thank you guys so much. Just uh, our typical closing announcements now. I'm just going to recap our upcoming events. Uh, tomorrow we have Reclaim in the morning and small groups in the evening, both on Zoom. On Friday, we have Game Night at 8 p.m. on Discord. On Sunday, we have 1820 at 620 on Zoom. And next Wednesday, we have our final GBM of the spring semester. That's going to be our special event, our senior testimony night. We'll be hearing from Matt. Darren and Jess, um, please uh, be sure to make it to support our seniors and to hear their stories. And I'll flash once again on the screen to close out the night our resources and social media in case you haven't uh, picked that up yet. Please give that a scan to stay connected with SCF wherever you go. Thank you again, John, for a really awesome message tonight. Thank you all for coming. Uh, hopefully these last couple of weeks aren't too, too much of a grind. Y'all can have some relaxation, but uh, hopefully your, your week goes well. Hope to see you at events throughout the week and certainly next Wednesday for Senior Testimonies. Have a great night, everyone.